Good morning. Our scripture reading uh, is from 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 7 and 9 through 13. I also received a report of scandalous sex within your church family, a kind that wouldn't be tolerated even outside the church. One of your men is sleeping with his stepmother, and you're so above it all, it doesn't even faze you. Shouldn't this break your hearts? Shouldn't it bring you to your uh, knees and tears? Shouldn't this person and his conduct be confronted and dealt with? I'll tell you what I would do. Even though I'm not there in person, consider me right there with you because I can fully see what's going on. I'm telling you this was wrong. You must not simply look the other way and hope it goes away on its own. Bring it out in the open and deal with it in the authority of Jesus, our master. <coughs> Assemble the community. I'll be present in spirit with you, and our master, Jesus, will be present in power. Hold this man's conduct up to public scrutiny. Let him defend it if he can. But if he can't, then out with him. It will be totally devastating to him, of course, and embarrassing to you, but better devastation and embarrassment than damnation. You want him on his feet and forgiven before the master on the day of judgment. Your flip and call out arrogance in these things bothers me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast too is a small thing, but it works its way through the whole batch of bread dough pretty fast. Get rid of this yeast. I wrote you in, early, in an earlier letter that you shouldn't make yourselves at home among the sexually promiscuous. I didn't mean that you should have nothing at all to do with outsiders of that sort or with crooks, whether blue or white collar, or with spiritual phonies for that matter. You'd have to leave the world entirely to do that. But I'm saying that you shouldn't act as if, as if everything is just fine when a friend who claims to be a Christian is promiscuous or crooked, is flip with God or rude to friends, gets drunk or becomes greedy and predatory. You can't just go along with this treating it as acceptable behavior. I'm not responsible for what the outsiders do, but don't we have some responsibility for those within our community of believers? God decides on the outsiders, but we need to decide when our brothers and sisters are out of line and if necessary, clean house. Now, regarding the one who started all this, the person in question who caused all this pain, I want you to know that I'm not the one injured in this as much as, with few exceptions, are all of you. So I don't want to come down too hard. What the majority of you agreed to as punishment is punishment enough. Now is the time to forgive this man and help him back on his feet. If all you do is pour on guilt, you could very well drown uh, him in it. My counsel now is to pour on the love. The focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Interesting passages of scripture there. Some of you are like, oh boy, where are we going with this? This is a little bit awkward. Let me touch on a couple of things first. Um, some things that were read there. So the second part is from the second letter to the Corinthians that, that um, Phil read. So that's 2 Corinthians. The other part was from 1 Corinthians. And so what we have in our scriptures are two letters from Paul to the church at Corinth. However, we're fairly certain, and scholars are fairly certain, there were actually four letters. Um, if we go back to the first verses that we read in chapter 5, uh, what does it say? Where was it? He said, I wrote you, this is verse 9, I wrote you in my earlier letter. So letter number one, we do not have. It's gone. And so, it's like, this is a follow-on letter. That we have here so first corinthians is actually second corinthians and then there's another letter so we read from second corinthians today 
But if you go back and read in chapter one, he said my earlier letter that I wrote, which was full, was a, a letter of sorrow, which doesn't reflect anything about 1 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians is a very straight, straight ahead letter. Hey, do this now concerning that. Now, there's nothing about tears in this letter. Because it says the letter of sorrow that was full of my tears. Like That's not 1 Corinthians. So there was another letter. What historians believe and what scholars believe is that the, the letter that Paul sent, first what we have, 1 Corinthians, generated a letter of response back to Paul, which was very accusatory, very defensive, very unpleasant. Many scholars believe that this, the actual third letter that Paul sent, part of it is preserved at the end of 2 Corinthians. I, I'm not saying this is the case. This is a scholarly opinion that is shared by many, but not all. Because the latter part of 1 Corinthians is Paul making this massive defense of himself, of why I'm an apostle, and how could you say these things to me? It doesn't fit the earlier part of 2 Corinthians. So some think it's like they were calling into question his being an apostle. They were calling into question his right to say these things. And so he writes them this really strong and hard and full of sorrow and tears letter responding to them. And maybe 2 Corinthians 10 through 13 is part of that. Maybe it isn't. We don't know. It's just kind of an opinion on, on how things are. So, Malcolm, sorry. I always I forget. forget. So, here we are now kind of crossing over from 1 Corinthians into 2 Corinthians. Well, we just talked about 1 Corinthians 15 last week. Why are we going back to chapter 5? Because chapter 5 is addressed in this letter. So here we are last week in this series of Corinth and the modern church with a situation in Corinth that was, well, awkward, to say the least. When you hear this kind of, when you hear Phil reading the, um, the scripture, it's like, ooh, do we really want to talk about this? Do we really have to talk about this? But simply, there was a guy who was having an affair with his father's wife, his stepmother. Yeah. And this makes it into our canon of scripture. Can you imagine for 2,000 years, We've been hearing about this one man. That is a man who has lived in infamy. We don't know a ton about the situation as it is. We know what happened. We don't know who. We don't know anything about the people involved. What bothers Paul isn't just the fact that it's happening, but, what the, but it's the fact that plenty of people knew about it. This is why Paul is addressing it to them. Nothing is said about the man's father or about the woman who was part of the affair. Nothing is said about it. Look what Paul says to them. He says this in verse, in verse six, your flip and callous arrogance in these things bothers me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. What was happening was not a well-kept secret. They knew, everybody knew. It's like us. We've got, what, 21, 22 people here right now, 12, 13 online. If something major and scandalous was happening, we would all know. That's what happens in a small community. It's like we know everyone. Everyone knows each other. We are, as the sign says, a church where everyone knows your name, and that's a great thing. But Corinth was small, and when this really major scandalous thing was happening, you cannot keep that a secret. The idea seems to be that people were aware of it, but, but just wanted to ignore it. So that maybe it would just go away. Just go away. But Paul is really taking them to task on this. Again, it's, it's not just the issue that this is happening. It's how the church was responding to this. He compares this sort of thing to yeast in a bread dough. Now, I, I like to make pizza dough. And I use probably more yeast than I should. But if I've got a pizza dough that is two and a half cups of flour, 
That's a lot of flour. And then you mix in two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. That's a tiny percentage of what the flour actually is. I mean, you're talking about something that could fit in my hand versus I need a bowl for the other one. And yet, you mix it all together, add your liquid to it and a little bit of fat and some sugar and salt, and boom, you have a massive pizza dough. And if I let that thing sit for a couple of hours, it will double or triple in size. And this is what Paul is comparing it to. If you let a little yeast into the dough, it spreads throughout the whole loaf. Those of you who are bakers know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are not, well, just take my word for it. In other words, if you pass over things like this, ignoring them, hoping they'll just go away, it will tear at the very fabric of the church. Now, stop for a minute and think about the reaction of the Corinth church. So understand, this letter was to be read at the Sunday gathering to everyone assembled. We're all here. We're all present. And this letter says, and as the presbyter is standing before everyone assembled, he says, I have also received a report of scandalous sex in your church family that shouldn't be tolerated. And everybody's like, <clears throat> It's funny, can you imagine? Oh man, he knows. This is, I think, likely coming from, again, I don't know this for sure, but if we remember our first week, we talked about Chloe and her family who give Paul the initial report about the divisions, that's from chapter one. I think this is likely coming from Chloe's family the ones who reported what was happening. This is where it is. So, so as this is being read, you could probably hear a pin drop in the church. It is commonly reported among you. Woo! But I think there's something more important going on here than just what this man was doing. And this is kind of important this morning. Yes, this was and is still deep immorality. You don't do that on any world, on any planet. And what's interesting is a lot of people talk about the lax morals of Roman society, and that's true. In Rome, anything goes and everything goes. No problem. But we're not in Rome. We're in Corinth, which is Greece, which is Greek. And the Greeks did not see things the way the Romans did. The Greeks would be scandalized by this just the same look at what he says in verse one i also received a report of scandalous sex within your church family a kind that wouldn't be tolerated even outside the church this isn't just romans being romans the greeks don't do that sort of thing when you compare this to what paul says say to the roman church in chapter one of romans you get the picture of how different things are. I mean, Paul's description of what's going on in Rome is pretty crazy. But you would not make this in the same letter to Corinth. These, these things aren't done. Paul's telling them what would, what's happening wouldn't be tolerated. They have not considered, this church, Corinth, has not considered how the church will be viewed by outsiders who are probably aware of what's happening. If it's not a good secret or well-kept secret in the church, I guarantee you people outside the church knew about it. They are so focused on simply avoiding the embarrassment of the situation that they are pretending it isn't there. Look at what he tells them in verse three. I'll tell you what I would do. Even though I'm not there, and consider me right there with you because I can fully see what's going on. I'm telling you that this is wrong. You must not simply look the other way and hope it goes away on its own. This is a bad thing that's happening in Corinth. Now, before I go any further, 
I'm not prefacing you to say this is what's happening in Silverbrook. So don't think that's it. Don't like, you know, I hope you're not waiting for the other shoe to drop. There's no shoe to drop. So this letter is meant to be read to the whole congregation and everybody is hearing it. Can you imagine that some of them are probably wishing they were anywhere else but in that church that Sunday morning? Wasn't there somewhere else we could have been to have to listen to this? So there's something else we could have done today. But here's the kicker. Paul is not addressing the pastor. He's not addressing the presbyter, as they called them, or the church leadership, or what they would consider to be the church president. He is addressing the entire congregation. It's a message for all of them. Now, we don't know who the actual pastor of the church was. We don't know who was leading the church at this time. It may have been Chloe. Shocker, yes, it could have been in the first century, a woman pastor. Even though we've tried hard to say they can't be, but it, it, it could have been Chloe. It could have been someone in her household. We really just don't know. It makes sense that these people, whoever it was, are the ones who were writing to Paul and saying, help. Help us. Whoever it was, whoever the church pastor was, the leader of that was, that person is not the focus of who Paul is talking to. This is a message for the people. It's really interesting. The key to all of this, though, I think, is verse 9. Actually, let me go ahead and go further on to 2 Corinthians. So we have 2 Corinthians, which I've said is probably, maybe, 4 Corinthians. But again, go do your own research. You'll find divided opinion on this. It is the response, though, and this is why we read that. So we get into chapter 2 here, and he says this in, in verse 5. Now, regarding the one who started all of this, this is the guy we're talking about. The person in question who caused all this pain, I want you to know that I am not the one injured in this as much as, with a few exceptions, all of you. So I don't want to come down too hard, which is easy to say because he came down so hard in that first letter. But uh, it's, you know, maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm being a little too hard. What the majority of you agree to as punishment is punishment enough. And so what we know is that the people essentially banished him from the church. They stopped fellowshipping. And, and in the earliest church, the community of believers was vital. Vital. We kind of look at church attendance and church memberships today as, eh, maybe we'll go to church, maybe we won't. Maybe I'll be a member, maybe I'll just stop for a while. But for the early members, first and second century, this was a faith that they possessed that was rejected on the outside and could lead to persecution. So the community feeling was vitally important, vitally important. And what they did was they took this guy and they, well, to use the, the Catholic term, they excommunicated him, cast him out of fellowship. Nobody would eat with him. Nobody would sit with him. Nobody would talk to him. And it became devastating. And so he repents, says he's sorry, and look what Paul says. What the majority of you agreed, agreed to as punishment is punishment enough. Now is the time to forgive this man and help him back on his feet. If all you do is pour on the guilt, you could very well drown him in it. My counsel now is to pour on love. So essentially it was restorative. They bring him back in. They say, all right, you stopped. You've repented. You said, you know, we're changed hearts. Come back in. And that's all well and good. Fine. But Paul kind of sums up the whole of this with verse 9. The focus of my letter, the focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. 
Paul needs them to understand that the health of any church is the responsibility of the members of that church. Paul's point of reference is the man from the first reading, but this idea permeates all of the church's health. All of it. The health of the church from giving to attendance to care for one another is the responsibility of the people of that church. This is probably the biggest thing that we today have in common with Corinth. Far too many people in a church expect others to care for the church. And this is what was happening here. Let me read it again to you. The focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender, but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. I want to read to you something we read two weeks ago. Bring it back to your memory out of 1 Corinthians 12. Listen to what it says here. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in that hurt. And in healing, if one part flourishes, every part enters into that exuberance. And I think that the point of all of it today is this. It's not to point out what this guy was doing, because Paul's already told you that. That really wasn't the point of what he was talking about. Things happen in churches. People are people. People fail. They do things. But how people respond is what's important. And the church itself, regardless of whether or not we're talking about somebody who is messed up or when somebody is hurting or when somebody needs something, somebody needs to be prayed for, somebody needs to be visited, whatever the case may be, the church is made to care for itself. We are the body of Christ and we are charged with caring for one another. This is one of the reasons why I have been so big on our ladies group and now our men's group, because this is part of community coming together to care for one another. This is a reason why I got down here on the floor and had us all stretch our hands towards towards Carl so we could, we could pray. Or Kurt, sorry, I was thinking Carl. Okay, good. One of you. This is why we stretched our hands to Kurt. Not just the pastor, but all of us. That's why we call one another, not just the pastor, but all of us. The church cares for one another. And so long as we, as a people, decide we want someone else to do it, the church will continue to limp along. And I don't mean just Silverbrook. I mean the church as a whole will limp along and will never be the place that God designed it to be, a kingdom place. A place where God's love of self-sacrificial love is displayed to everyone. We are to be a beacon of the kingdom of God. We are to be a light post. Jesus said, what? A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And if you light a candle, you don't put it under a basket. You shine it. This is the purpose of the church. This is the purpose of us. And as we close our, our, our series on Corinth, Corinth was not caring for the members of Corinth very well. Remember, we talked about the members of the body. Oh, we do this. Oh, the pastor does this. No, the evangelist's better. No, the prophet's better. And everybody else is better than one another. He's like, no. If you don't have love, you're nothing. And then Paul says it again. The focus of my letter wasn't on punishing the offender but on getting you to take responsibility for the health of the church. My friends, yes, I am the pastor. I'm called to share with you, to teach, to pray, to be there. But I am one person. 
we all, all of us, have a responsibility to care for one another, to pray for one another, to be there for one another, to help one another, to laugh with one another, and to cry with one another. This is what it means to be the church. This is what we are as a community. Let us be that people. Let us be that church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray, please. Lord, we are humbled by the examples that we see in Corinth. We're grateful, Lord. We're so grateful that we have these things that were written that can help us to walk the path that you've called us. Lord, I pray that you would birth in each of us a desire to be kingdom people who love and care for one another. But more than that, that we would be the church, the body of Christ. Lord, let the light of your love shine in us towards one another, both in our community and outside. We ask this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen.